Okay, 5.2 proteins and enzymes. There's so much here. Uh, I'm not going to read through it. Um, probably call me up on me if I've forgotten one of those after you've watched the video. Come back to this and see whether I've done everything. All right, let's get into it. Uh, a lot to memorize. We've done the amino acids, polymers, um, amino acids and monomers going to protein polymers in the last one, five, uh, B.1. Uh, there are 20 amino acids, don't really care about that. Go, You need to go to your data booklet to see all of the um, amino acids and you're going to be referring to those. Uh, you must know this is the amino group and you must know this is the carboxylic acid group. But you should have known that from uh, organic chemistry already. Uh, and this is where the difference occurs for the different types of amino acids. So um, what happens here is that's a carboxylic acid so the H plus can pop off and it can actually go over here as well uh, so this one actually has a neutral charge uh, drawing it like this is also um, a neutral charge so whatever the pH is uh, that of when it's in that situation that's called its isoelectric point so if you look at the data book you'll see that different amino acids are in this neutral situation at different pHs. Uh, and so amino acids are called zwitterons because they can be both anions or cations. So if there's a whole heap of hydroxyl groups on there, they'll rip the H pluses off, these will be more negative. So they'll be anions, not cations, and the reverse is true as well. If there's heaps of H pluses, well, they'll bind onto here and this will become positive. Um, and so that's called amphoteric. So that should sort of be revision. This is sourcing, going back to previous topics, onto 11. Um, and buffers, uh, topic nine, um, and so we're covered. All right, so just a bit of application of previous topics with a uh, different chemical, really. Um, and so this one's a, a good diagram because it shows you um, that the different groups are losing uh, H, going from this to this, uh, or this to this, as you're going in this direction. Uh, and so uh, this particular situation occurs at high pH and this particular situation occurs at low pH. All right. Um, and so moving on, um, this is an exam question. Uh, so a mixture of serine glutamic acid and lysine was separated using electrophoresis at a pH 5.7 buffer. Uh, a drop containing the mixture was placed in the uh, center of the paper and potential difference were applied. Uh, what are the results? So which uh, amino acid is here? And tell me why. Let's just do this one first. Describe one character's amino acid electric point um, has no charge. Um, and various answers related to that. Let's just get that one out of the way. Predict who's at C. Uh, so I need to go to the data booklet and look up serine glutamic acid and lysine. You're just gonna to have to appreciate I'm looking at the data booklet. I will copy and paste. Glutamic acid is 3.2, 5.7, 1L lysine, 9.7, 9.7, here we go. All right, so let's, um, so obviously this one's smack bang in the middle, so this one's supposed to be in the middle. So uh, at 3.2, um, there is, it's not 3.2, it's 5.7. So there is uh, way more OHs uh, being applied to this chemical. Uh, and so if the OHs, they're going to be taking the H pluses away. And so this is going to have a negative charge. Uh, the lysine likes to be neutral 9.7, but it's 5.7. So there's an excess of, of H pluses. Uh, and so the H pluses will be pulling up, will be um, sort of adding to like the NH groups. Um, and so that will make this thing overall positive. Um, and so the negative one's gonna go over here, which is gonna be uh, glutamic acid. Have I been calling that glycine? I'm not editing that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going back and changing that. Uh, and this one's positive, so the lysine will be over here. So predicts which acid C. Um, glutamic acid, uh, because excess, um, OH groups uh, create uh, positive charge on amino acid 
double A, that's the shorthand for amino acids. I'll write the amino acid word out. Okay, uh, did we do okay? First do the bottom one, no charges, balanced charges, no charge, yep. Okay, we got the answer correct. Uh, becomes negatively charged, did we say that? I think we did. Um, oh, we gave the wrong answer. I said the right thing. Uh, so negatively, uh, excess OH is pull off the H pluses to make the thing negative. Ooh, I did say that up here if you just want to check me. All right, um, so we got it right, but transcribed it wrong. Okay, isoelectric point uh, is below buffer, acts an acid, loses H pluses. Ooh, did we say that? Um, uh, because excess OH has create negative charge on the amino acids. Um, oh, here we go, it becomes negatively charged. Um, acts as an acid, loses H pluses. Uh, we didn't really say that one. Okay, so we're only giving ourselves a two for this one. All right, um, so, you know, maybe I needed to word it more. So I really need to say um, uh, excess OH creates um, takes the takes creates negative charge on amino acids um, by taking away H pluses. A bit harsh, um, but yeah, okay. Um, this one's a bit of an old question though. Um, you would have got two, it wouldn't be out of three these days um, and you would have got the marks for that. Okay, so moving on, uh, formation of the protein. Uh, so the important thing that comes up quite a bit is this peptide bond that the syllabus uh, really likes to call an amide link, amide bond. Uh, when I was at uni we used peptide bonds because it makes a little bit more sense and it's easy to remember anyway. Um, so the amino acids, you can see that there are groups here decide which one's different. Um, I haven't expressly talked about melting points and solubilities uh, because it's just too much of a link. It's in the syllabus for this bit, but it's just really too much of a link to topic four. Uh, so obviously look at the, the groups, the amount of bonding, the size, molecular weight, and uh, intermolecular forces. Uh, obviously you want uh, strong hydrogen bonding and you want a small uh, particle here for it to be soluble um, so it's like water uh, and hydrophilic uh, like this one so this is small hydrogen bonding so that's more likely to be soluble um, and this one uh, less so especially some with the long chains coming up um, and so as we mentioned before you remove the water condensation uh, and that uh, lets these two sticky ends stick together and then you get this peptide bond uh, and so you need to be able to recognize this uh, this carboxyl group and an amide amine group here uh, so next uh, the protein has uh, three structures it has the covalent bond in here the primary structure of the order of the amino acids and then they uh, they line up with hydrogen bonds to form either sheets or they, they form this little sort of circle uh, that's called an alpha helix and a beta pleated sheet, you need to know that. Um, and then all of that together uh, with further different links besides the hydrogen bonding uh, is the tertiary structure. And then you can have lots of these sort of protein bits stick together, like four of them to form the quaternary structure. So that's really four different proteins. Uh, and so we're moving on. Uh, this is just a summary of it because it's quite a bit there. So the primary structure is the covalent uh, primary order. The secondary structure learn alpha helix and beta sheets. Tertiary structure is all those other different types of bonding and interactions that occur uh, with all the other side groups. Uh, that's where denaturing occurs. And then adding lots of peptides together is the, the fourth, the quaternary structure. So that just has to be memorized. Here is a picture of it. Uh, showing you the, the alpha helix and beta pleated sheet. Uh, the tertiary structure, this is quite important, especially the disulfide bridges, which are, are very strong. Uh, this is regarded as an ionic bond. Uh, this here is um, hydrophobic, uh, so that's van der Waals. Uh, and so all of these are tertiary structures. So anything that's an alpha helix or B depleted sheet. Uh, then we're moving on to uh, the difference between fibrous and 
globular protein. So the fibrous proteins are primarily the secondary structure, um, and that's all there is to the the, the structure of uh, that's all there is to the structure of the molecule. So, uh, the globular proteins uh, they're more rounded, and they take into account a lot more than just alpha uh, alpha helix and beta pleated sheets. Uh, you will need to know one of these. So. Uh, the fibrous proteins are not soluble uh, and so I think keratin's probably easier to remember because your hair and skin's made of that and that's not soluble uh, and then probably you know hemoglobin uh, you've probably studied before um, and so that's called globular and that has quaternary structure as well uh, with the f uh, and so we can move on okay so protein analysis um, so protein analysis is basically we get the proteins and we break them up into the amino acids using enzymes or heat and then we detect the amino acids by chromatography or electrophoresis. So first up is chromatography. Uh, we will get a solvent uh, where the amino acids uh, dissolve in those and the ones that are more uh, that dissolve in them better will move up quicker and that's how we can tell the difference between the amino acids we need to compare it to a value uh, and so what we do is we divide the distance the amino acid moved by the distance the solvent moved so the distance the solvent moved uh, will be this area here and the distance this pink one moved is here so you divide one by the other that's the Rx factor the retardation factor and then you can get uh, some value that you can look up. So uh, this is a question now. So a mixture of amino acids was spot on to chromatography favor, uh, blah, blah, blah. Ninhydrin you need to know is a toxic chemical you won't be using because it's not safe and that will just show up the amino acids um, and determine the RF for this. So as we saw in the previous slide, the RF, don't know why it does that, equals D on T. So you need to get your ruler out. I'm just going to guess that. Maybe that's 5 and that looks about double. So I'm just going to jump to 0.5 um, and hope the answer scheme does the same. Uh, and so the answer scheme says 0.5. Voila! Uh, and you can even get away with just using the formula in this case. Okay, so the second uh, thing you can do besides doing the chromatography uh, is the electrophoresis which we just uh, talked about before. Um, and apart from staining by ninhydrin, you can use UV light, which is, I think, what I did at uni many decades ago. So just moving on to the most important protein, arguably, are the enzymes. Uh, and so enzymes, if you're in biology, you'll know this already. Uh, they have, this shape is critical uh, because the shape allows them to interact with the reactants, which are called substrates in this case. Uh, and products are still called products and so this is an induced fit so they just fit uh, and it's sort of the bonds in here just attract it just enough and in just the right place to bend certain other bonds and that bending is just enough to cause slight breaks uh, which would never occur otherwise uh, and so that's the chemical understanding of why enzymes actually work and only the chemistry students will know that. Uh, so it's putting stress on certain bonds to their breaking points so that they just happen to break in certain places where they otherwise wouldn't top. Just like bending a pen for some reason and bending enough for it to snap, but um, you know, you've selectively decided where you're going to bend that particular bond and where you're going to particularly snap that particular place. Uh, and so the active site is critical for that. Uh, when you lose the shape of the active site, it's called denaturing. And denaturing can occur by, um, you know, anything. So like uh, if something binds to the outside, like heavy metals, um, and also you, this, the activity can also be increased by binding. If it's increased, it's a cofactor. Uh, if it's not increased, it's inhibitor. Uh, and you can have... Um, I'm going to high level. The inhibitor can be here and it can be here and they're different but that's high level so we'll skip that for the time being. Uh, and so the cofactors that are um, vitamins are called coenzymes and I think we can move on from there. So there's a summary. So um, these things are so, the shape is so specific and peculiar that there is like a million times increase in uh, reaction rates uh, that would never have occurred otherwise. Uh, with enzymes. Uh, so they're proteins, highly specific, um, 
minimum uh, maximum rate with substrate saturation uh, they're usually mixed in liquids and they have other chemicals that can interact with them whereas the inorganic catalysts are far more stable uh, they're usually just metals, uh, but because they're just metals, they don't have this super specific shape that they can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things that enzymes can do. Um, and so they don't get saturated because they're just sitting on a, a you know, on the bottom of a beaker. Uh, so they can be heterogeneous, uh, not regulated. They're far simpler and can withstand high temperatures and pressures, obviously. These metals can just sit there forever. Um, and so the downside of, of this stabi stability uh, is they're general and slow compared to the enzymes. Uh, they're, they're specific and, and extremely fast, but uh, have specific uh, conditions, which is why we're talking about buffers in high level. So you've got to keep the pH just right and the temperature just right. Um, so moving on. Uh, so talking of temperature and, and pH, uh, and pressure but specifically here um, this is uh, very common um, we're adding uh, the reasoning for it so when you increase temperature disrupting the hydrogen bonds that are holding the tertiary structure together so that's where the denature denaturing occurs because of that uh, this area here is a gentle slope this is simply um, rates of reaction um, this is simply increasing uh, the temperature it's got nothing to do with denaturization. It's too cold to react. It's warming up. That's why it's reacting. Here's when you're getting the denaturization. With the pH, the um, excess H pluses or XHOH minuses disrupt um, the shape. So reactions with R groups and H ions change the tertiary structure. So denaturing is occurring on both sides of this pH. That's why they have steep drops on both sides. Uh, whereas characteristically the, the temperature, you can tell it's a temperature, not a pH, because it's a gentle slope, this one, and these ones are very steep drops, okay, because of the nature of what's going on. So moving on, uh, the effect of heavy metals. Um, sulfide groups are very strong bonds, and the metals can interact with the sulfide groups as such, uh, and you can see that there's quite a different shape change going on here. Um, and so you need to remember this word sulfhydryl groups uh, and so the metals interact with the sulfhydryl groups forming covalent bonds uh, and uh, interact and get in between it and bind to the sulfur groups and that's quite a lot I know um, but that's organic chemistry uh, biochemistry okay